So what we're going to talk about today is uh, a concept that you know a thing or two about. Um, that is Gnosticism as category. So just prefacing here, um, Gnosticism as a monolithic term is, to say the least, sometimes looked at as problematic in academia. Um, yeah. You have on one side of the fence scholars like Michael A. Williams, Karen King, more recently Matthew David Litwa, who argue for a complete dismantling of the term, offering alternative uh, terminology such as Sethian Christian or biblical demiurgy. I know Dr. Litwa has um, suggested negative demiurgy. You also have scholars who agree with the validity of the validity of the label of Gnosticism, provided it meets certain criteria, right? So this would include Berger Pearson, David Brackey. Bentley Layden and yourself. Um, I found it interesting that you've argued that Sethian cosmogony and anthropogeny is too rich and far reaching that another name to describe this distinctive perspective on divine care is required. Um, and that specifically Sethian or Christian does not suffice. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on this. First of all, there, there are a lot of reasons to dispense with the term Gnosticism. Um, the term Gnosticism was uh, uh, coined in the 17th century and became uh, used widely by, uh, well, theologians and philosophers in subsequent centuries to describe, uh, well, the, a vague meeting of esoteric philosophy and the cult science in Roman Alexandria, um, sometimes taken uh, in sometimes taken as represented by the philosophy of Plotinus and sometimes taken as the chief opponent of Plotinus's philosophy. But uh, the notion of Gnosticism, or uh, as it is called, uh, uh, die Gnosis in German, is really uh, developed mainly by theologians and then occult philosophers. Uh, uh, for, for French writers, it's la Gnose in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, with the development of the historical sciences and scholarship of early Christianity at the end of the twenty, at, at the end of the nineteenth century, and especially the beginning of the twentieth century, um, words like Gnosticism or, or Gnosticismus become to be used to describe the thought of the heretics that are. Uh, reputed to have called themselves uh, Gnosticoi as heresiologists or heresy hunters like Irenaeus of Lyon wrote in the second century. What's the problem with this term? Uh, as Michael Allen Williams wrote in his uh, groundbreaking book in the, the 90s, uh, Rethinking Gnosticism, Arguments for Dismantling a Dubious Category, the term came to pick up all of these cliches that do not really seem to pan out when you look closely at the evidence pertaining to the Gnostics, especially the Coptic Gnostic corpus, that is the body of books preserved in Coptic, uh, late, uh, this, the final stage of the Egyptian language uh, that were discovered uh, from the 18th century until today, uh, the chief representative of which is of course the Nag Hammadi corpus, the uh, 13 manuscripts found in Upper Egypt probably around December in 1945, right? So Williams, looking at the uh, bounty of Gnostic scriptures, uh, texts that seem to resemble the thought of the Gnosticoi or knowers described by heresy hunters like Irenaeus, Williams said, all of the cliches we have about Gnosticism don't fit these texts we found from Nag Hammadi. Therefore, we should describe what we used to call Gnosticism with new terms. And the one that he suggests is biblical demiurgicalism, that is these Coptic Gnostic texts, they talk about demiurges, that is craftsmen, world makers, and they're indebted to the Bible. That's enough. For Karen King, she acknowledged the uh, that there are different literary traditions you can isolate in the Nag Hammadi and related texts. Um, the most predominant of which is the so-called Sethian tradition. These are texts uh, with a lot of characteristics as a family resemblance, you know, uh, between them. But the the big factor they all share is their emphasis on uh, the fig figure of Seth, the third child of Adam and Eve as revealer and savior. Um, she looked at these texts and 
thought, well, they also seem to be Christian. So why not just call them Sethian Christian, the Christians who are into Seth. That's it, right? I'm convinced by a lot of their arguments, but I'm not convinced by all of them. And I'm certainly not convinced that the texts formerly known as Gnostic are not distinctive from a Christian uh, worldview, especially from the perspective of early Christian philosophy. And the reason for that is the complex of evidence which, for which the term Gnosticism has traditionally been used um, actually does present us a distinctive perspective on divine care. That is to say, when we look at the myths, predominantly the Sethian myths, but also uh, myths associated with other Gnostic schools or teachings, we often find a disjunction in how divine care is described. And often these myths are glossed with the language of Greek philosophy. They use the language of pronoia or care to explain this disjunction. That is, divine care, divine involvement from the aeonic realm, the true realm, the, true, the truly divine realm of the true God, the Father, was active, so these myths tell us, in the creation of human beings in some way, but not in the creation of the world, okay? This is quite different from what we find in other Greek philosophical schools that describe divine care as present or absent for the world and human beings together. And this is also very different from what we find in so-called proto-Orthodox, or I should say any non-Gnostic um, early Christian or Jewish or ancient Jewish philosophy, which describes God as being active in the creation of human beings and the cosmos. So Philo of Alexandria describes uh, God as a creator, not just of the rational part of the human soul, but also of the world that we inhabit today. But Gnostic texts like the secret book of John do not. They describe providence as intervening in at, at the creation of human beings and responsible for the implantation of a divine rational element in the protoplast, the first human, Adam, but as not intervening in, on behalf of the world when the lower demiurgic figure, uh, the Archon Yadobaut, goes about making the world that we live in. This is a real disjuncture, okay, in thought about providence in ancient literature. And it's so distinctive that I think we need some term to describe it. And given that it is predominant in this body of evidence, both heresiological and in the Coptic body of Coptic texts that we've been finding since the 18th century, it's prominent in both sets of evidence, evidence that is associated with the figures called Nostokoi in antiquity, the term Gnosticism seems to me to be a useful one to designate it.